Thanks everyone for joining. Uh, this presentation is part of our Impact Center training program. And uh, we'd love to have you to our facility to visit for a full hands-on training course when we open back up. But for now, um, Neil Systems has decided to offer these shortened versions um, as online free training courses, and we hope you find them beneficial. My name is John Lamp, and so you know who's presenting here. I have a master's degree in mechanical engineering from the University of Virginia, and uh, I worked there as a research scientist and later um, I was an expert witness investigator for motor vehicle collision dynamics and restraint systems. During that time, I focused heavily on measuring and analyzing uh, forces, acceleration, and vibration. Um, then later, I transitioned over into industry um, uh, to, to measure and analyze rotating machine vibration. And so I've been with Neil Systems for nine years doing that. And in that time, I've had the opportunity to train um, with a variety of different customers and also the manufacturers that Neil Systems represent. And at different points in time, this has included um, Metrics Vibration, uh, Setpoint, as well as Samsara and Ulta Solutions. So um, measuring and analyzing vibration has been a passion of mine for about 14 years now. This presentation is the first in a two-part series. And today we'll cover the basics necessary to understand um, and answer the question, are wireless vibration sensors suitable for safety shutdowns? And along the way, we'll discuss the pros and cons of some different monitoring technologies that are currently on the market. So why did we choose to address this question? Uh, well, you might've noticed that the market has recently been flooded um, with a whole bunch of uh, new wireless vibration sensor options. And with them, we've also seen a flood of misinformation as well. And so hopefully this presentation will help you evaluate uh, any options you're considering for your facility. And as a caveat, um, we're not going to be considering rack-based vibration monitors uh, here today because the question in itself assumes that the equipment that we're looking at um, is not quite critical enough to warrant the cost of uh, permanent rack monitoring solutions. So that'll be the topic for another presentation. Um, this presentation focuses on systems and sensors that would be considered um, or should be considered for most pumps, compressors, blowers, cooling towers, and large electric motors. Um, one more caveat, uh, this information is intended to apply generally as, um, you know, to all brands, but we do have some information here that's been provided by our vendors. So you'll, you'll see a name here or there, but this is not a sales presentation. Um, so let's get into it. <clears throat> Oh, here, real quick, I am going to, I'm sorry for the interruption, I'm going to mute everybody. Um, and like I said a few minutes ago, if you are uh, logging in now, feel free to use the uh, chat function. And at the end of the presentation, I'll swing back around and check that and see if there's any questions um, that I need to answer. Um, but here's our path for today. We're going to start with vibration data itself. Um, how do we analyze it? And then uh, or at least, you know, just cover a couple tools and then um, we're going to look at the equipment. So we'll look at a couple of different categories of equipment and spend some time understanding exactly how wireless sensors work. And then uh, lastly, we're going to look at vibration alarms. So how do you want to be notified um, when your system or, or when something in your asset changes? And so uh, with that information, we will go back to our original question and see if we can answer it. All right. So, uh, this is a picture of a jet turbine engine, and I love this picture. I think it's beautiful, um, so much going on mechanically. And uh, the other thing that this picture does, other than just uh, be very pretty, in my opinion, is uh, it tells us a lot about all the different components that are moving inside a machine that can uh, cause or contribute to the vibration. And so on the left, um, over here, you can see there's some gears, and then we've got uh, bearing, we've got impellers, more bearings and impellers. Um, even more gears and a shaft over here. All these different components, as they're spinning, are going to create uh, force oscillations that result in vibration um, and add up to the overall vibration that we might be able to measure in, on this asset. Um, and so if we look at uh, a curve like this, for instance, we've got a bunch of simple um, sine curves all adding up together to create this more complex sine curve down here at the bottom. And, and this complex sine curve might be what we're able to measure and the, and the question is, you know, how do we take that measurement and make it useful? How do we use it to understand um, the condition of, of our machines as they're running? And so 
Uh, we do have some tools, and one of the first things that people like to look at is, is called level or severity of the vibration. And uh, level might be a better descriptor, but you know, severity assumes that the, the level of vi the vibration corresponds to the condition of the machine. Um, and certainly for a wide, a wide range of um, you know, con you know, failure modes in the machine, uh, the more they fail, the worse the condition gets, the more the vibration is going gonna, is gonna to grow and become more severe. So um, a couple different measurements we look at are called the peak, which is the center line, the distance from the center line to the top of the curve, the vibration. Um, and then we might also look at RMS. And the reason we would want to consider RMS is it's, it's really easy to measure electrically. So it's a convenient measurement for us to take. And a lot of standards take that into consideration and use RMS as um, an amplitude or measurement for vibration. And the last one I want to show you is called peak to peak. So when we're measuring displacement, we're typically measuring from um, the bottom of the negative side of the curve to the top of the positive side of the curve. So over here in this graph on the right, I've showed you an example of some vibration data uh, that increases and decreases. And so you can see the amplitude in RMS um, peak and peak to peak all shown on top of each other just to help you visualize how those signals differ. Um, and you can see how important it is to know in advance what kind of signal you're looking at um, in order to define uh, the, the type of severity measurement that you're making. So here's another tool that, uh, when I learned it the first time, was really helpful for understanding why people use uh, certain measurements and um, want to compare acceleration versus velocity versus displacement. So um, let's just consider for a second, we have an impeller rotating on a shaft and um, the impeller happens to have a heavy spot right here at this red dot. But otherwise, the, uh, the impeller is not, you know, there's no other vibrations contributing um, in this uh, pretend case scenario that we're looking at. So um, as this impeller starts to speed up, um, going from, you know, stops to maybe, let's say, 3,600 RPM, you would expect the vibration, um, if measured uh, from an accelerometer on a bearing, it's holding the shaft in place. We'd, we would expect that acceleration to do something like this, where at very low speeds, um, the forces required to keep that shaft in place are going to be low, and um, they're going to be oscillating slowly because this, this uh, heavy point is moving back and forth, um, you know, along the measuring axis fairly slowly, and as it speeds up, the force that's required is going to speed up, right? And so assuming the same mass and the same uh, machine stiffness, then we're going to expect a uh, increase in the acceleration at that bearing. Um, but that increase is going to be accompanied by, um, it's going to be a much faster cycle time. So, um, you know, the fact that the acceleration is increasing uh, as, the, as the impeller speeds up, it's creating a little bit of a problem for us because this impeller mass is not changing. So the severity of this vibration or the severity of the, um, of the vibration mode that's causing this acceleration, you know, that, that off balance mass is not changing. So this would be considered um, somewhat, you know, constant, uh, constant severity vibration, even though the acceleration is increasing, the problem is not getting any worse. It's, it's really just uh, the acceleration is a factor of the, um, of, of the speed of the vibration or the speed of the machine. So um, if we wanted to set a uh, threshold in, in acceleration that we're not comfortable with it, we would say we would want to set an alarm to, um, you, know, you know, have our machine get checked or shut it down. We would have a hard time setting that uh, alarm level without knowing the machine speed in this case. So what can we do? Um, well, one, one of our options is to integrate that accelerometer signal. And it's interesting, you can see, um, this is sort of data that was made up, but this is a real integration. So um, you can see at this end, the area under the curve, uh, at the low end, the, the magnitude of the acceleration doesn't reach very high, but there's a long time for the velocity to build up in the positive or negative direction. Um, and as you get over to the other side of the curve, the amplitude is high, but there's not very much time. So it essentially makes up for um, itself. And when you integrate that signal, you get a, gen a generally flat response. And, and this is the case um, over a pretty wide frequency range. So um, typically we say from about 1,000 uh, <clears throat> CPM or cycles per minute up to about 10,000 cycles per minute, um, this, this uh, idea holds where velocity is generally um, pretty, uh, you know, pretty linear, or sorry, pretty flat in terms of its response. 
um, for vibration severity. So that can help us when we're setting thresholds in uh, determining what severity we like. We prefer, uh, most of the time, we're going to prefer to look at vibration severity in terms of velocity. Um, and then I'm going to show displacement here just to point something out, and that is um, when we get into really high speed machines, uh, it's pretty typical to see fluid film bearings. And in the case of a fluid film bearing, um, the shaft isn't isn't ever contacting the machine or isn't, you know, isn't in direct contact, metal to metal contact with um, roller elements in a bearing, for instance. And so the vibration is a lot harder to measure if, if you're trying to look at the shaft motion. So um, what we tend to use is a displacement proximity probe. And the interesting thing here is as the machine gets faster and faster and faster, uh, that displacement probe uh, based on this curve is actually getting less and less sensitive for us. So there's a bit of a challenge there, um, but it's just interesting to point out that the sensitivity could be a concern for displacement at, at higher, um, higher frequencies. Um, so once you have a measurement and uh, a measurement of your vibration and level, um, it might be helpful for you to consider a severity chart. Um, so these things are, uh, you know, you can find them from different suppliers. Metrics Vibration uh, supplied this one. And, um, you know, what these are used for is determining how severe your vibration is, and, and maybe this will help you set your alarm levels at your facility based on um, some standards that, that are generally accepted uh, ac across, uh, you know, maybe your industry. So um, looking at this chart, uh, the, I'm going to highlight some of the different axes because it's pretty complicated when you first look at these things. Um, frequency is the x-axis, and so you'll see the frequency increases from 100 CPM, that's cycles per minute again, at up to 100,000 cycles per minute. And these are logarithmic scaled um, uh, intervals here, so 100, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000. Um, and so that's kind of how this chart work. it's, works. It's, it's usually logarithmically scaled here. Um, and then on this diagonal axis, we've got acceleration. And that goes from um, a thousandth of a G all the way up to 100 Gs across the chart here. The next axis is our vertical axis. So uh, constant velocity is uh, these nice horizontal lines here. And these range from uh, 0.01 inch inches per second up to 10 inches per second. And, uh, but the cool thing is that this chart really shows how um, that graph I showed you in the previous slides was um, it, it, the fact that this velocity is flat across the different um, frequencies is a good is a good you know visual for for how um, velocity can be used um, ac across a wider range of applications so um, the last axis is displacement it's on this diagonal and so what you would do uh, with this chart is you would look at your um, you know either your motor speed or your uh, machine speed or if you know the frequency of the vibration you can actually uh, compare that with the, with the scale down here on the x-axis. And so let's say you've got a 3,600 CPM vibration. And so you, you start down here and you follow that up to, let's say, 0 0.2 inches. And you're going to end up right on this line here where um, you're getting out of the fair vibration zone into the rough vibration zone. So, um, you know, for, this, for your machine, is it exactly the same? Maybe you have slightly different standards. And so I'd recommend checking, um, you know, your industry, wherever you are, what your wherever your end user or uh, if you're a facility, you know, whatever standards you guys are using, um, they probably have some good recommendations here for, um, for your vibration uh, thresholds that you might be interested in uh, to help you decide when to shut down your machine. So I've got some of these listed up here and you should definitely consider checking them out. Um, so uh, that covers vibration data, at least from a, uh, you know, pretty quick overview. And we're going to jump into vibration equipment now. So the first thing I want to talk about is case uh, case vibration. And when we mount a sensor on the outside of a machine, whether it's bearing housing or maybe a motor casing, um, what we're looking at is the absolute case motion of that machine. And so uh, it's important to remember that's the case motion, and we're uh, really trying to understand what's going on um, inside of that machine by listening to the outside of the machine. Or, uh, or, or, you know, putting um, a sensor on the outside of the machine. So it's worth pointing that out. And then um, in the next slide here, what I've shown is a proximity probe or a picture of a proximity probe mounted through the housing. And so in this case, what we're looking at is relative shaft motion. And that's because uh, with the proximity probe mounted in the housing, um, the, sh the shaft, while, uh, you know, the housing is moving, so the shaft 
um, it, we're looking at the shaft motion, but it's relative to the position of the probe, which is also um, theoretically moving. So it's helpful to call this relative shaft motion just so that you remember um, that we're looking at you know relative shaft motion, not absolute shaft motion. Um, so I'll I'll show you a little bit more here some examples of sensors mounted um, up here in the upper left side. Uh, I've got a pretty typical looking installation for a, a retrofit of a velocity transmitter. And, um, the velocity transmitter, here's my mouse, is right here. And then you've got your conduit elbow um, to connect to the velocity transmitter. And that velocity transmitter is mounted on a little uh, mounting pad that is you know, bolted on securely to the machine housing. So, um, you know, I say this is a retrofit because it looks like the manufacturer of the of the uh, asset here did not include a specific mounting for this for this device, and so they needed that pad. And this looks like it's going to work pretty well. Um, so, you know, that would be considered a, a, a pretty good mounting for an instrument like that. But something that you want to be really careful of is this picture down here. You can see, um, in order to get the 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 velocity sensor, same sensor here, mounted on the machine surface, what the customer did is they created this uh, sort of you know, half or semicircle, you know, portion of a flange and then welded this cantilever beam out there. So um, in terms of position, the sensor is near where it needs to be, but it's not actually on that surface. So if there's vibration happening in this housing, it's got to transfer through the flange and then into this cantilever beam, right? So we're losing potentially some vibration in the flange. And then this cantilever beam is filtering um, the vibration with its natural frequency because this cantilever beam is going to have its own natural natural frequency that it's vibrating. And we may even see um, an increase in vibration as a result of exciting the natural frequency of that cantilever beam there. So um, is this sensor actually measuring the vibration here in this in this housing? You know, I'd say we have no idea, right? There, you know, <laughs> we don't know what this thing's measuring. Could be measuring close, could be far away, but we want to avoid cantilever beam style mounting. So um, that's a that's a big no right there. And then uh, over here, I just wanted to show you a machine with um, a switch on it. So this is a switch mounted to, to measure axially. And then we've got some vibration probes installed in the X and Y orientations. You can't see the one behind the temperature sensor. Well, you can sort of see it over here, but um, you've got uh, orthogonally mounted vibration probes looking inside the machine. And real quick, I'm just going to show you um, what that looks like inside the machine. So here's a different machine. Um, this is a pump. And over here on the far right, you can see We've got some proximity probes, again, mounted orthogonally in the bearing housing. Um, so I'm going to take you through a couple of pictures here and uh, you know, show you what that looks like inside. So here we've got the bearing housing taken off, and you can see the shaft and, and the bearing. Um, and if we want to look at that housing uh, with, the, with the proximity probe <clears throat> holders installed, um, you know, that's here. And we can flip the housing upside down and see that the proximity probe holders um, are mounted through the housing here. And that's where the probe would come out and it would come through this hole here and be mounted such that um, it can see the shaft. And so how would we do that? We would wanna make sure that gap is, is really accurate, right? We wanna get a really close and accurate gap um, from the probe tip to the shaft, um, you know, maybe about 50 mils. And so in order to do that, we're gonna have someone go out and gap the probe. And in this case, the probe is um, threaded in backwards into the sleeve. Uh, there's a reverse mount probe, and the sleeve then inserts into the shaft holder here, and, and you tighten it down when you get it exactly where you want it on the machine. So when you're done, um, you get it all assembled back together, and uh, you know you, you you then um, are, are good to go. You can um, you know it's, it makes it pretty easy. You don't have to um, you screw the probe down into the machine if you're using one of these holders, um, and if because if you're doing that, you've got the cable and everything, and and it's it's harder when you're screwing to get the position exactly right. So these holders are pretty um, convenient. Uh, but that brings us to uh, some equipment categories. I want to go over hardwired sensors um, and, and transmitters. And then we'll just spend really briefly look at uh, some considerations with portable solutions. And then we'll dive into wireless for a little bit. <clears throat> so uh, a, a typical accelerometer is going to have a housing here, you can see in the diagram. So you know, this is what one might look like and the housing is, is here. At the base of the housing, we've got the mounting threads and then the base where we're mounting our crystal. So um, accelerometer is, is usually based on a piezoelectric crystal that generates a voltage based on the amount of force that's across it. So this mass here 
as the accelerometer um, it is moving, this mass is going to um, put a force, mass, you know, force equals mass times acceleration on this crystal. And the voltage across the crystal will be sent through this amplifier and we'll get an output of 100 millivolts per G typically. Um, so that 100 millivolts per G is going to is going to give you a voltage that moves as the sensor moves, right? So here's your acceleration. I'm using this um, plot here that we, I showed you earlier as uh, to represent my raw data. So an accelerometer is going to give you a raw data output that moves. Um, with the voltage is moving with the sensor in time, um, in real time as it's happening. So what's the difference between a sensor and a transmitter? Uh, well, a transmitter takes that same accelerometer signal from the bottom of the housing and then sends it through um, an, an integrator and an RMS detector. In this case, we're integrating to get velocity. And um, the RMS detector is gonna give us the level of that velocity vibration. And now instead of this black line, we're looking at the blue line. Um, so that's, the, that's our level measurement. And then we're gonna have an ADA converter um, turn this into a 4 to 20 signal for us. And now what we have is this two wire loop powered output. And that's gonna behave a lot like uh, pressure transmitters that you might be familiar with elsewhere in the facility. And so, um, you know, that, that's, that's a convenient signal. We don't need a signal conditioner. We don't need specialized equipment to trend it. Um, so that's a really convenient way to do sensors. And here we've got a few different examples of how hardwired sensors might be installed. And so there's a whole bunch of different ways that this can happen. But um, in this case, I just wanted to show you three common ones. The top one is exactly what I just showed you is the, is the vibration transmitter. And this is giving you four to 20 velocity. Um, and then the next one down here is an accelerometer going into a switch. So the switch is then interpreting that acceleration signal um, for that 4 to 20, just like the transmitter did. But it's also looking at um, some, real, uh, some thresholds to trigger relays. Um, so if that, if that RMS signal goes above maybe the first threshold or the alarm threshold, you're going to get one relay. It's going to say, hey, look, you know, something's happening to this asset. needs attention. Um, and then typically what you're going to do is set up the other relay to do uh, shutdown functionality. And if you exceed that second relay, um, then the machine is going to be turned off automatically. And you'll see uh, these vibration switches commonly included in specs. And so we quote them a lot. Um, then that, the last one here is a proximity probe setup. Um, very similar idea, except the probe uh, measuring part is separate typically from the driver and transmitter. Uh, but here we can take this transmitter and uh, you know, the raw data coming out of the probe and analyze it, calculate the peak-to-peak um, -peak displacement and convert that into a 4 to 20 signal as well. So all of these uh, outputs can be, uh, you know, uh, they can be brought to a typical PLC and trended um, or you, know, you can run logic on those without any specialized equipment between the, the instruments and the PLC. Um, so advantages of hardwired solutions, typically you're gonna see um, an MTBF of, of 100 years or more can be attainable. What that means is you're not getting 100 years out of a sensor, but if you have 100 sensors in your facility um, and one failed per year, you, you'd be in line with a 100-year MTBF. And then um, for, uh, you know, for, for these hardwired uh, solutions, you're also, you've got constant monitoring available. So your sample time depends on your PLC, but um, you, know, you, you have constant access to that data. And then the disadvantages are going to be your installation costs, um, which can often exceed the price of the equipment itself and uh, either the raw data loss, or if you want to keep that raw data, it becomes really expensive to sample and store it. So the cost of raw data is pretty high for um, hardware equipment. So <clears throat> real quick with portable, um, you know, we could talk about a lot of different variations of portable equipment, but if you're a facility and you're considering a portable solution, you really just have to think about um, you, know, you, you want the right person at your facility, someone who's got the experience to understand your assets and provide um, the right level of expertise on uh, you know, how your assets are, um, you know, are, are operating and how healthy they are. If, you know, if, if, you, um, you know, if you don't have that right person, then that kind of changes everything, right? So it really, since, since portable solutions depend on the expertise, um, you know, the, the equipment's almost becomes irrelevant. What you tend to get is these, you know, really nice reports over time that tell you which machines need to be focused on that you can use to plan your maintenance. Um, so, so the real advantage of portable is the expertise that, um, that you get with a portable solution. And then um, it's nice that you can, uh, you know, per point, if you already have someone coming to your facility, adding other points, not a big deal. So there's usually room in, in the budget to add even the lowest priority assets if you're going with a portable solution. But 
disadvantages are that you're going a long time between sample intervals. Typically, your portables guy might come by around um, at, at the most, like once a week is what I've seen, sometimes once a month and, and certainly longer. <clears throat> We've seen schedules for once every six months. Um, and there's a lot going on inside that machine that happens between sampling. Um, the other, the other uh, disadvantage for portables is it's hard to get that sample. Um, you know, maybe you can get it in the exact same location, but it's hard to get it at the same process conditions. And so if you're not taking samples all the time, it might be confusing if at one point you see the sample when, when uh, the, you know, the asset's working at a really high pressure, a really high flow rate or something like that versus um, when, when, when it's, you know, different, different conditions. So um, yeah, there's a disadvantage there for, for potential for inconsistencies. And then that brings us to wireless uh, setup. So what is a, what is a wireless <clears throat> solution typically going to consist of? And usually you've got your, um, your sensor and that's going to be mounted on a machine. The sensor is, is in most cases going to have a triaxial accelerometer. Um, some of them have temperature and then almost all of them are going to be battery powered. Um, they're going to have a Bluetooth is, is the most common way to communicate back to the gateway over here. So this over here is our gateway and our sensor is mounted on the machine communicating Bluetooth back to the gateway. And what it's doing is waking up um, every you know, certain interval, taking a really small amount of data and then sending it to the gateway. And then the gateway is going to store it um, on, on local storage. And then most likely the gateway is going to use built-in cellular communications to put that data in the cloud. So you've got small chunks of vibration data coming into your gateway and going up into the cloud. Um, some of these gateways have uh, industrial communications. Some of them even have um, industrial I.O. Uh, most of them are going to belong in a panel somewhere. And so a typical setup is going to look something like this. Um, a sensor is mounted on your assets, sending raw data clips to the gateway. Gateway is sending this information up to the cloud, and that's where you get the huge advantage of the wireless um, solutions because the cloud is able to perform these advanced um, diagnostic calculations and, and heavy processing, um, you know, uh, algorithms that you, know, you don't have to own all the equipment that does that expensive processing, right? So if the cloud's doing it, if Amazon Web Services is, is doing all that for you, then um, you don't have to worry about owning all that equipment. And, and now you can log on to the internet, uh, you know, set up your, your dashboards and get custom reports based on portables, or, or sorry, based on the wireless sensor applications. And so um, this is a pretty typical setup for how wireless works. Um, but, you know, what is wireless? It's essentially um, portables, but without the expertise, right? And then instead of having a person come around and do your, um, you know, your sampling and your reports, um, you get a, a bit faster sampling interval. So for advantages, I put insulation, right? So you don't have to run conduit, and that's a big cost saver. Um, the advanced diagnostics, I mean, that's huge that, that you're able to um, keep the data uh, in, in its raw form and, and really get some interesting information out of it. Um, and I put longer sampling intervals here as a disadvantage because it's important to realize even though we're sampling every five minutes, um, in some cases, maybe every one hour if you want longer battery life, um, there's still a lot going on between samples that you're missing. So um, the last disadvantage uh, that's important to mention, mention is conduct, or sorry, connectivity. So signal loss um, is, is almost always a factor with any cellular device. And a three-year NTDF is common for, for generic cellular device. And that just basically means if you've got um, three of any type of cellular device, and that includes your phone, um, operating for a year, you're likely to have at least one communication issue over that time. And that would be considered pretty reliable for, for cellular. Um, so <clears throat> given all of that, um, you, you know, it's it, one last thing we want to consider is how do we want to be alerted? And that has a lot to do with, um, you know, what we want our alarms to tell us. And uh, in some cases, if we keep the data uh, complex, we're able to go up in the cloud and we can get really advanced alarming capabilities um, that are specific to frequencies. And, you know, if any little tiny thing changes in the machine, we can be alerted to that. Um, whereas if we're going to simplify the data and uh, look at the overall level and, and you know, use severity, we were relying on industry standards to tell us that, you know, in most cases, based on most failure modes, we're going to be able to shut this machine down in time for you to um, save some money for your facility and protect everybody, right? So um, depending on what you want to do, uh, that, that would help you decide, you know, which direction you want to go with your data. <clears throat> so the big question is, do you keep it simple 
um, or do you keep it complex, right? And I'm wrapping up the presentation here. I know I'm two minutes over now, but I'm real close to being done, so appreciate your patience. Um, so simple level data is generally easier, easier to interpret, and that's a big deal. Um, if, you've, if you've already got a preset alarm, um, if you've got, you know, you're following standards for your industry, you know what to do when the alarm goes off. Um, you might have already caused some damage to your equipment when this alarm goes off, but at least you are um, taking care of the really important stuff. You're taking care of your personnel and you're keeping um, your assets in, in hopefully good enough condition that you can repair them quickly and get them back up and running as fast as you, as you can. But um, if you, on the other hand, go to like a complex, um, switching over here on, on the right, go to a complex version of alarming, um, you might get notified for things where, you know, you don't know what it means, right? You know, you might have to do some research, you might have to get an expert involved and, um, you know, make a decision. The next line down here is alarms may not, you know, may not require action. So, um, whereas with uh, simple level data, your alarms are going to be, um, you know, very few false or ignorable alarms, right? You're, you're generally taking action on all the alarms for your simple level data. and so. The thing that I like to think of is, you know, do I want to be woken up in the middle of the night by a, uh, you know, by something changing slightly on my FFT analysis? Um, and the answer is, you know, it depends on your asset, right? But probably no. I, I can look at that in the morning. Um, but if if I've got a, a level alarm that's going off, um, then then you know, I, that's that might be an emergency that that is worth me waking up for and going down to the facility to check it out. So. You know, would you be willing to be woken up in the middle of the night if you've got um, both then and both go off? I think that tells you, you know, this is a really important event that you need to go take care of. Um, with simple level data, you get constant monitoring, whereas with complex raw data analysis, you're almost always using segments of data. Um, with simple level data, you have uh, generally high reliability. Um, and, and the trade-off with complex complex data is that you've got the potential for even earlier detection of your problems. Um, and then, you know, with simple data, you're looking at numerous industry standards that you compare to. And, and sometimes that's good. And sometimes that encourages like a set it and forget it mentality where you're not really familiar with your machine. Whereas the complex raw data, if you're always looking into things, maybe not always, but, um, you know, as, as often as you're getting informed about changes in your machine, you're learning your machine, right? You're getting to know it. You're setting your alarms so that um, they're not going off all the time. And over time, you, you know what's weird and what's normal. So um, you get a lot more familiar with your machine when you're looking at complex um, data analysis. <clears throat> so with that in mind, let's, let's go back to our original question. I've set aside a couple different requirements for safety applications. And the first is for any safety application, if you've got people um, working on these, these assets or nearby, you need constant monitoring. I mean, you can't wait, um, you know, hours, weeks, uh, even really minutes between taking um, samples. And then the next one, you need to know that when, when there is a problem, you've got a very high reliability um, factor between catching that problem and having it turn the machine off or, or notify somebody of, of what, what procedures need to happen. And then the last thing is, you can't have you know false alarms telling your um, maintenance team that that you know you don't want to you want to create a mentality that when the alarm goes off you don't necessarily stop what you're doing. You, the alarms need to be easy to interpret and um, and, and they need to be uh, you know clear clear exactly as to what's going on when when the alarm goes off. What what is our response to the facility? So um, in in all these cases. It, we as Neil Systems recommend that you always go with hardware if it's going to be a safety and, and you need to uh, really keep the um, hardwired um, purposes separate from the purposes that you're trying to accomplish with your wireless sensors. But um, what is the advantage of a wireless sensor, right? So if uh, you're in maintenance, then this is a pretty familiar curve for you. Um, it's called a PF curve or, or, or potential failure to functional failure interval. And so when something changes, damage might occur in a machine, um, the condition starts degrading, right? And eventually you get to a point where the machine's not doing what it needs to do. And so with a hardwired sensor, you're really expecting to catch the machine somewhere in this zone, in the corrective zone. So before the machine completely fails, um, you wanna you want to be alerted and, and, and told to stop the machine or stop, stop the asset before um, it, it causes so much damage that it becomes essentially, you know, impossible to repair or at least very expensive to repair. So 
this cost of repair line is going up here. Um, so, so if you're if you're here for the simple level data, and in most cases that's where you're going to be, but it does depend on the failure mode. Um, what is the, the the wireless line when you've got that advanced diagnostic capability? Well, what you can do is you can catch problems potentially um, before they even become problems, right? So. If you just start to see, like, uh, you know, for instance, like a really high frequency um, vibration start to, you know, appear in your FFT, and maybe you look back at your schedule, you find out that the maintenance guy just replaced the variable. Um, maybe it was done wrong, right? So you call them up and say, hey, go fix that. Go, go, you know, that, that high frequency vibration is making me think there's a lubrication problem. Go redo the oil, and, and maybe you can catch it early. So the idea with the advance is that if you know your machine well enough, you have the potential for that early detection and early detection really saves a lot of money. So thank you everybody for joining.